Well, good morning, folks. How are we doing this morning? Yeah. Look, I tell you what, kids camp was a blast a couple weeks ago, and I have to tell this story because it was awesome. One of our kiddos, he just so happened to be in my small group, just... He went, he had fishing as one of his activities. He literally had a catfish about yay big on his line. The catfish was bigger than him, and the stupid thing snapped, like, from, he, from here to here. I was like, no! <laughs> no! I was so mad for him. I was, he was just like, oh, well. And I was like, no, we're going to go back. We're going to get it. We didn't, but that's okay. So for those of y'all that don't know who I am, I'm Zach Barnes. I'm the student pastor here at Family Life Church, so I get the pleasure of working with your middle schoolers and high schoolers. And I tell you what, your, your kiddos are a blast. I love them. And the fifth graders that I just spent a week with, uh, I'm super also looking forward to them coming up and getting to know them better. Uh, that is also a really fun group of kids. And like I just said, I can't wait to get to know them. So today, we get to kick off a new series that we're going to do over the next few weeks. And... It's going to be called, This Life Be Like. I'm sorry, grammar people, I did not make the title. But it's called, This Life Be Like, and it's because we're going over some of the different parables that Jesus used to teach some different points. Uh, Illustrations of kingdom values, values that he held and values that we are supposed to take and also make fundamental and foundational as part of our lives as we live out our lives and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we're pretty much diving right in today. Uh, Today we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 25, and we'll start in verses 14 through 30. This is the parable of the talents. It's a very familiar story for anybody that spent time in church for any amount of time. Uh, And again, when we say the word talent, it's not specifically talking about like an ability to do something or being able to play music or something like that. That's not uh, what this is talking about, at least in the uh, example that Jesus is showing. Within this context, uh, talent is a monetary unit. It's it's money. And so depending on which uh, translation of the Bible you're reading, it might say bags of gold instead. And so that might be why you're saying, but my Bible says this. It's, it's the same thing. They, they go back and forth with each other. So again, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 uh, through 30. And I'm going to pray real quick over us. Fathers, thank you so much for this morning. And thank you so much for this time that we have to spend together. And Father, I just pray that you just throw my stupid face out of the way. And that you work through me and that you speak today that way. That whatever it is that comes out of my, my mouth honors you and not me. And that you can get my nerves out of the way and all that stuff, Father. We love you. We praise you. It's your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to start just in the first two verses, and we're going to kind of break it up a little bit because it's a lot of stuff to read all at once. Uh, But starting in verse 14, she says, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. Okay. So within those first two verses, we just start to see that this master is about to go on a journey. This isn't like a quick light day trip or like a little weekend trip. He's expected to be gone for a very long time. And so while he's gone, he hands his property over to his servants. Uh, but he doesn't split them evenly. He doesn't split them evenly. Again, to, the, to one, he gives five. To one, he gives two talents. And then another, he just gives one. Why? And so it's just simply because he gives his property each according to his ability. And that's a key phrase that we're going to come back to here in a little bit. But the solid early takeaway right now is this. It's just that God cares about the quality and the heart of the work opposed to the quantity. He cares about the quality of the work and the heart behind the work. Picking back up in verses 16. He had received the five talents, went at once, and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he went who had the two talents, made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me five talents. Here I have made you five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, so I will set you over with much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. 
His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over with much. Enter into the joy of your master. So we're given the accounts of the first two servants. Again, one's given five and the other is given two. Both servants do exactly what is expected of them and they put it to work in doing so. Again, the servant with five talents turns it into 10 talents. The second turns his two into four. But then, of course, we get to our third servant who plays it safe. We're going to put safe in quotes. And just goes and hides his master's money just in hopes of not losing it just so he can bring it back to him later. So the master's long journey is over and has returned home. He calls the servants over to settle accounts uh, to see what his servants has done with the property that he entrusted in their care. Again, the first two come with the, first, uh, with the fruits of their labor, and they say, Master, we have doubled what you have given us. But both servants get the same response from their master. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I'll set you over with much. Enter into the joy of your master. I want you to notice something that we're going to come back to in a moment. But notice how even though each, two firsts of, the, each of the first two servants bring back two very significantly different amounts back, they both get the same reward, the same reward. So again, it's that well done, you are faithful and little, you'll be given more, come and celebrate and be in fellowship with me. Again, we're going to come back to that here in a little bit. But then we come to our third servant, picking back up in verse 24. He also, who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered to him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have, so- where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For anyone who has more will be given more and will have abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he does have will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth." So our third servant does not get a very happy reaction. If anything, it's very, very polar opposite of what the other two get, and probably even still pretty, pretty extreme for what he was expecting to get back. Again, he literally takes the talent that he was given, digs a hole in the ground, and is like, I'll throw it in there. Make, hopefully something doesn't come along and dig it out of the ground, and I can just take it back to him later. He digs it and buries it in the dirt. He, and for it, he's called wicked and slothful. The master scolds him and, he's tell, and he literally just goes, you should have at least put it in the bank because I might have made like another two bucks off of it. Like if you're just going to do that, you might as well at least put it somewhere where it's going to gather interest and do something at least. But because of his laziness, he then takes the talent and gives it to the servant that, that now had the 10. He then proceeds to say anyone who will have more or anyone who has will be given more and will, be, and will have an abundance. But whoever does not, uh, what they do have will be taken away then cast the worthless servant into the dark, into the outer darkness. But before we continue on, I do want to at least kind of put a little bit of clarification on something that might sound kind of weird for verses 29 and 30. Um, this is not, again, the, even though he's using a money amount, a monetary amount, as an example, we are not specifically talking about money. We're not. And so whenever it talks about in 29 and 30, uh, it is not saying that if you have money, you will have more money. And if you don't have anything, well, what you do have, God or the church will take away from you and they'll just kind of leave you to the wolves. That is not what that is saying at all. So again, even though it's using, that, the, using money as an illustration to point this, value, this kingdom value across, uh, the parable is 0% about money. Money and possessions can be a part of what you're gifted with, but it's not the point that we're talking about. So ultimately, what is this parable about? What does this story about a dude digging a hole in the ground and getting in trouble for it have to do uh, with our lives today 
and our walk with Jesus and what are we supposed to do with this. First off, let's establish who's who. In a lot of the parables and stuff, like Jesus uses um, illustrations and things like that to talk about stuff, and there's usually you know, who's who and what. Each character is supposed to re- present, represent very real people. And so in this case, who's who? First and foremost, who's the master? The master is literally Jesus himself. He's putting himself in that master's position. And if Jesus is that master, who are supposed to be the servants? We are. We are the servants. Some of us faithful, some of us not. So again, if Jesus is that master, then where do, we, where do you think we are on this timeline within the parable? He hasn't left for his journey, or he's not still, still there waiting to leave for his journey preparing. But he also hasn't come back from the said journey yet. He's still gone. He is still off on this journey. And he's given us different pieces, different gifts to steward and care for while he's gone on that journey. He's given us the care of his church, his creation, and an immeasurable abundance of gifts and opportunities to care and share for the gospel and share the gospel, aka talents. Talents both for us and in the original audience could be uh, more simply put as gifts or opportunities. Because like I said a moment ago, the parable itself isn't specifically about money. It can be part of it, but it is in 0% shape or form the main character. People have tried to make it about that, and unfortunately that's just very poor interpretation or just straight up like abuse of it or misuse. So with that proper lens of, okay, we're not talking about money, we're talking about gifts and opportunities that Jesus has placed in our care for us to do while he's gone, let's go back and try and go back from uh, the beginning and really see what Jesus is putting out for both his audience at the time and for us. So again, that first line in verse 14 gives us a very important reminder that uh, not just for, that isn't just for the parable, but it's like, it's literally for everything. And it's, a, it's something that we need to remember at all times. It says, the master entrusted his servants with his property. Not our property that he saw, liked, and was just like, oh, let's use that. That's kind of cool. It was, but it's his. Every living thing, every non-living thing, every ability, every gift is his. Not mine, not yours, not mom's, his. And we have been entrusted to care for it, to steward it, and put it to good work. Then verse 15 also gives a point that a lot of us like to look over and miss. The master gives each servant his property to care, each according to his ability. God created each and every one of us. He knows us better than we could ever know ourselves, than anybody else could ever know us. He created us with a full potential to serve his kingdom. Each one of us are to live up to that full potential by the strength and wisdom given to us by Christ. The stewardship of the kingdom is not a side gig. This isn't a hobby. It takes all of us. It takes all of our being, all of our talents, our abilities, whatever spiritual gifts that he may have blessed us with, our energy, our personal experiences, our attitudes, and our material resources. It takes everything. It takes all of us to do that. And again, God will not entrust someone with more than they can handle, but he's also not going to entrust somebody with less than they can handle. This does not mean that you are going to go through things in life that you cannot handle. I've seen this taken out of context too. You will absolutely go through things in life that you can't handle because the entire point, in a sense, in Christianity is a dependence on Christ. 
because we can't save ourselves. He's the only way we can do that. He's the only way that we can be saved. If we don't go through things in life that we can't handle, then that dependence on Christ literally means nothing. At that point, he's just kind of like a pet that you can be like, oh, I love you right now, and I'm just going to go back to my old things. What this does mean, though, again, it's that he'll entrust us with things that we can handle as far as the gifts and abilities that he's given us. And if we don't have that, then that's not something you were, that you were created to, and to, created to handle. But here's the thing. If you're truly listening to God and depending on him for guidance, and again, having that full dependence on him, uh, God will not give you a gift or a responsibility you cannot handle. Sometimes we try to do that ourselves, and sometimes we pay the price for it. But God's not going to give us something if we can't handle it. See, there's a reason I'm not a professional lacrosse player. Part of that is because well, my joints are literally falling apart. But it's also because I cannot handle that gift. There's a reason uh, that I'm not, you know, a lead pastor. <laughs> there's a reason I'm not that because I cannot handle that. And fortunately, I have someone that can, and I'm very, very thankful for that. There are things that he has gifted me with and, get, and has blessed me with that I'm obviously very thankful for because he's blessed me with a musical talent because I was created to handle it. Not because I, ha- I gave myself the ability to handle it, but because he created me to handle that. He's blessed me with the care and stewardship of our teenagers because he created me to handle it. Again, not because I had the ability on my own to handle it, because if that was the case... It would not be good. But he created me to handle that. It doesn't always feel like it, but he did. So this might be a bit of a rabbit trail, but I do think it's kind of an important one. Uh, whether it be material things or abilities, uh, we tend to want things we don't have. We tend to want things we don't have. We tend to want money that other people have because we don't have it. We tend to want other people's spouses or significant, uh, significant others because we don't have them. They have it, but I want it. I don't have it. We tend to want followers or viewers on social media platforms uh, because, you know, they have that. Why can't I? I want that too. If we don't keep our desires and our wants in check and surrender them to Jesus, uh, we have to do that because not only can we potentially hurt ourselves, we will harm others. Here, let, let me say this again. We can hurt ourselves, and probably will, but we absolutely will hurt other people if we don't keep our wants, desires in check. You have what you have because God lovingly created you to handle it and steward it. Again, you have what you have because God lovingly and intentionally created you to handle it and steward it. So now that the master's left, we're at the end of verse 15. And in 16, again, the first two servants put their master's money to work. Uh, But there are two words in there that we need to take notice. Does he leave and it says they they prayed about it for, for a little while, or then they sat and thought about it for a little while? No. It says, at once they went and put their master's property to work. And they went to work. They waste no time at all. They go and bring their master, and they go and return a, and a, uh, bring a return for their in, investment. For the original audience, this would not have been a weird idea for the servants to like immediately just go to work with it. So we didn't see the servants sit and wait or pray about it uh, because they've already done that. They've already been doing that for a long time, and they were prepared. Uh, to do the work once given the opportunity. Because in the Roman Empire, I'm putting kind of a little bit of a contextual uh, bit to this. Uh, Back in the Roman Empire, slaves and servants had the ability to earn wages. They had the ability to earn bonuses. Uh, They could even purchase property. So servants in that point in time would have already been praying, thinking, and preparing for an opportunity when given one. We're to do the same thing. No matter what season we're in, 
We should always be praying and seeking Jesus in our wants and desires and in our gifts and abilities. That way, when Jesus gives us the instruction to take on a gift or opportunity, we can be proactive and go to work at once. We can go to work at once. Some of us know what God has placed on our hearts and are, are either doing that thing right now or are, are striving to go for, to go for that goal. Uh, some of us have stories that are similar to mine where we're thinking uh, we're going to do one thing, we're working to do this thing, and we're going and we're making steps forward, and then God says, okay, time to change roads. Like, fork in the road, go this way. And then some of us are in places where we're like, I don't know. I, I'm literally just waiting for God to tell me anything or to communicate anything or give me guidance in something. I'm literally just kind of in a holding pattern, pattern doing a circle around this thing. Guess what? All three of those places are okay. There's nothing wrong with any of those places. That's one thing you need to know is that no matter which of those three places that you are, it's, it's fine and it's good because growth is possible in every single one of those places. Growth is possible in every single one of those places. But no matter which of those places you are, you are still to be praying and seeking for God's guidance and wisdom for the opportunity that he gives you when he gives it to you so that you can go to work at once. So again, our first two guys get rolling. But our third guy, again, not so much. Because he knows that his master is stern and doesn't, he doesn't want to lose what his master gave him, again, he plays it safe and just buries it in the ground and just kind of hopes that some dogs don't come along and dig it up and take off with it. See, I can understand the thought of just not wanting to lose it because I can see things in my life that I'm just like, I just don't want to lose it, so I'm going to do this and not put any risk or anything at all. But the biggest thing here is the fact that the third servant literally just does not know his master at all. He doesn't know him. Because if he really knew his master, he would have understood what was expected of him. He knew of his master. He knew that the master was, was stern, that he was a hard man. He knew of him, but he didn't know his master. You'll hear Robbie say this every now and then. You can know of God, but you need to know God because those are not the same thing. Our third servant failed to realize something that was very, very important. Even though he had little, he still had every ability to put it to work and reach his full potential just like the other two. But instead, again, he plays it safe and does nothing with it. The other two took risks in putting their master's property to work. See, there's a 0% guarantee that they would have gotten anything back. Because if war or famine would have come into their home, uh, they could have easily just lost everything and would have been donezo. But they still put it to work and were as wise with it as they could be, and it worked out in their favor. They took a risk. So then our master returns. It's time to settle accounts. First servant comes forward. And it was, that was entrusted with the five talents. Returns with ten. Second servant, again, we had two. Returns four. The master gives them both the same reward. They both get the well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over little you will be entrusted with more. Come into my joy. Again, both servants receive the same reward because both servants reached 100% of their potential. They reached 100% of their potential that, got, that, that the master entrusted them with. Both, both servants receive the same reward. They both took an obedient risk. Again, risk, key word. They took an obedient risk, and they reached their full potential. The servants lived their life uh, and faithfully committed to their master because they knew him and his heart. They both knew their expectations because they knew their master. And they both received the full reward. 
And again, we are to do the same because again, our master is Jesus. The well done awaiting us, uh, or at least those that lovingly serve and live obedient lives to Christ, uh, is that not only are we entrusted with more, but we also gain entrance into the kingdom of God where we're going to spend the rest of eternity. We start in a default stage, in a default setting of outside the kingdom. But getting to know our master then allows us access into that kingdom. See, our first two servants act out of a loving loyalty to their master, while the third acts out of selfish fear. The first two are acting out of, a, out of motivation to please the master, while the other acts out of fear of displeasing him. These motives do sound similar, but they are also very, very different. Uh, there's a fear of the Lord that is healthy, and it's also critical to having a faithful, uh, live a faithful and holy life. Uh, you can look in Proverbs 1 and 1 Peter 1 as kind of little references where that's shown. But that fear is not paralyzing. It's not paralyzing. If anything, that fear ought to encourage us because we know that Jesus is, kind of, is literally on our side, rooting for us, encouraging us, equipping us to do whatever it is that he's called us to do. A healthy fear is accompanied by the knowledge of Christ's love for us and his desire is to know us and have us as a part of his kingdom. A paralyzing fear, which is what that third servant has, knows nothing of that love. He just knew about the hard part. The servant's safe behavior was ultimately a disobedient heart. It was a disobedient heart. He plays it off as not wanting to lose the master's property, but in reality, uh, he, was, he was selfish. He was lazy. He was arrogant. He was like, I don't need to do anything with this. I'm just going to put it in the ground and give it back to him when he, gives back, when he gets back. The master's obviously looking for some sort of return in his investment. If he wasn't, like as he states, it would have just been better off to just been put in the bank to gather interest. But instead of investing and putting the master's property to work, uh, he refuses to take any risks at all, and he just acts on self-interest instead of kingdom interest. The master calls him wicked and slothful. Wicked and slothful. We usually don't, those aren't terms that we typically use. But he's called wicked because, again, he acts in self-interest instead of kingdom interest, and slothful because he did nothing with what he was entrusted as we stated in verse 15, the servant had 100% or 100% had the potential to go and do good work with what his master gave him. Because again, he gave each according to his ability. But instead of going to work, he just go, literally goes and sits on it, does nothing. And because of that, uh, what little he did have, again, was taken away and he was cast out of the kingdom forever. He was left in that default stage of outside the kingdom trying to get in. And he was at the point of no return where there was no more second chances. Verse 29. To those who have much will be given more. To those who have little, what they do have will be taken away. Again, we're not specifically talking about material possessions. But when we act in obedience with what Christ has gifted us, we will be entrusted with more. When we don't act in obedience... What gifts we do have will be stripped away and will be cast out of, or more accurately, left out of the kingdom forever. As our third servant discovered, gifts not used for the kingdom are ultimately are wasted and ultimately lost. They're wasted and ultimately lost. Many of you don't know my story and kind of like how I came to be here. Uh, Spoiler alert, if you would have told me a year ago today that, that I would be right here, I would have laughed and been like, you're a nut job. Because this is not where I saw myself at all. See, I, I, I attended, I moved up here in 2010 and attended West Texas A&M. And I graduated in 2015 with a bachelor's in broadcasting with an emphasis on electronic media. My intention with that was to go into sports broadcasting. And for the entire seven years I was at West Texas A&M, and that includes a little bit of grad school, um, I did that. 
uh, from, from semester one, I was involved with our radio station doing play-by-play -play and color commentary for all of our different sports. And from then on, ish, and kind of just going up through the years, I spent about the last four years of it or so uh, working directly with West Texas A&M Athletics doing their athletic live streams. I was in charge of live streaming uh, every single home game except for like track and cross country and all but football and basketballs until we got to tournaments. Uh, I provided my own play-by-play -play for every one of them and I got very good at it. I have a national championship award on my, in my office with my name on it. I was good, but I hit my cap. I hit my ceiling. I hit my potential. Then towards the end of grad school, I also, unfortunately I didn't finish, uh, but I'm also thankful that I didn't. But he called me into ministry. He's like, the, the, the position for tech and media opened up and Pastor Robbie approached me uh, about taking on that position and I said yes. And I did that for three years. And unfortunately I hit my potential kind of early, like within the first year and a half. I hit my potential there and I hit my ceiling there. Now there was probably a solid year, year and a half of I have no idea what I'm doing here. I don't know, like, I know this isn't like my forever thing that I'm going to do, but I literally don't know anything else that I would do. There's like nothing else in my heart that I would want to do because I don't, I don't want to go back to athletics. That was exhausting. Then come mid-August of 2020, it'll mark one year in like two weeks. Uh, pa our brother, Pastor Jason, who was our former youth pastor, um, announced to the staff that he took on a head position at another church in town. And of course, we were like, yeah, go Jason! And, another, and then we were also like, no, but Jason! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but he went and did that, and then after that staff meeting, uh, Robbie calls me to his office. I walk in, and Jason's there on the couch, and I'm like, oh, no, Jason wants me to go with him? Uh, I don't, uh, I don't know if I can do that. We're rooted here. I don't want to, uh, I don't know. And I sit down, and Robbie just immediately just kind of goes... Zach, we want you to, to prayerfully consider putting your name on the table for the youth pastor position. <laughs> huh? For, you're joking, right? Like the pure befuddled look on my face, I wish I could like reproduce, but I can't. And then I had like two weeks to think about it thanks to a kidney stone and, you know, surgery to remove it. That was fun. But eventually, you know, we get here. I say yes, and here we are today. And I wouldn't change a single thing about it, except maybe drink water. Drink more water. Like, <laughs> that was not an awesome experience. That was number two, and it was significantly worse than the first time. But ultimately, here's the takeaway from this parable. Know Jesus. Be prepared. Be proactive. Know Jesus, be prepared, be proactive. I'm not going to lie, I totally have a hard time with the be proactive part. And I know a lot of us do too. But I don't tell the story to be like, dude, look how cool and awesome I am, and how cool stuff I did. I'm so far away from that. But we all have different levels of high, how high our potential is. We all have different levels of how high that potential is. Uh, but it doesn't matter how high it is if we're not willing to take the risk and be obedient. It doesn't matter if you've got five talent guy potential if you have the attitude of one talent guy. Because either way, it's going to be wasted and be thrown away. There's a point in time right now that uh, a lot of us need to get off of our spiritual recliners and get to work. Jesus doesn't have a desire for us to play it safe. His desire for us is to risk everything that he's given us for his glory. Because again, he's given us what we need. He's entrusted us with this thing. So he obviously wants us to do something with it and work with it. And he's obviously in some capacity going to have some success through it. I have a feeling Jesus is kind of poking and prodding at several people to get off their couch and get to work. I know there are a lot of areas in my life that he's poking me to get off the couch and get to work. Sometimes, like, literally, he's like, dude, get up, mow the lawn, because you have a jungle back there. But here's the deal. There are several ministries, one within our church in particular, that are 
waiting with anticipation for people to come and be a part of that ministry. Here's the thing. You get, whether, whether you're currently serving or whether you're not yet or whether you're in a season of, of rest, which is totally fine too. Like, don't think that if you're in a season of rest, that's legit. Like, that we're going to be like, how dare you? Like, that, that's cool. Like, that's also necessary. But you're not a cog. You're not a cog in a machine that is church. Door greeters are just as important as I am. Our information desk folks are just as important as I am and just as, as important as Robbie is. Our, our, our people wiping butts in the nursery are just as important. Our small group leaders for youth are just as important. You're not a cog. The point of the parables is that Jesus, that Jesus uses uh, is to teach and to show people kingdom values and values of Jesus, of Jesus and what it looks like to follow him. In this case, what, what this life, the life of a follower of Christ be like, the value he's giving us is the value to know Jesus well, to spend time and be in a relationship. Because in the parable before that, uh, the entire point of it is be, pre- like, be prepared for whatever's happening because you don't know when the master is going to come back. Or in that case, what, when, the, when the bridegroom is going to come. To get to know Jesus and to prepare ourselves so that whenever that opportunity or that gift is given to us and it is provided, we can at once, again, not like sit and kind of think about it, so we can go at once to work and take risks for the glory of God and his kingdom. I'm gonna pray over y'all this morning. Father, we love you and you are so, so good. I thank you so much for each ability, every gift that you have given every single one of us uh, that are in this room, not in this room, but I'm so thankful that one, you've created each and every one of us with a specific gift and a specific talent per se that we're expected to reach 100% of that potential and that we absolutely can reach 100% of that potential through you. I pray that no matter what that thing is, whether we're in that season of waiting whether we're in that season of needed rest or in that season of service, that we're always praying and looking for your guidance. That way, whatever gift and opportunity comes along that you provide, we can see it. And again, immediately go to work with it. Father, pray that we spend that time to get to know you. That way we can serve you loyally and obediently and lovingly instead of just kind of acting out of fear, knowing that, you can be harsh or something like that. Let us know you, let us be prepared, and let us be proactive. Father, we love you, we praise you. It's in your name we pray, amen.